Our next speaker is exceptionally popular and another EWTN favourite. I'm sure we have many EWTN viewers here, do we? Let me see. He is currently a professor of theology and scripture at Franciscan University of Steubenville, where he's taught since 1990. And he is the founder and director of the St. Paul Centre for Biblical Theology. In 2005, he was appointed as the Pope Benedict XVI Chair of Biblical Theology and Liturgical Proclamation at St. Vincent Seminary in La Trobe, Pennsylvania. Congratulations and please welcome Dr. Scott Hahn. For so many years I've been listening to Donna's music, but now I don't have to turn on my CD player. I just get to look up and see her. What a, a joy it is to share the day with you, and with you, my brothers and sisters, and with my dear brother and good friend and colleague at Franciscan University of Steubenville, Dr. Mark Maravalli. It's rather daunting for me to get up after him and share, as I will, about the Blessed Virgin because in so many ways he's been my teacher over the years, over the decades, going all the way back to when I first entered the church 21 years ago. So I'm going to spare him the embarrassment by not asking him to leave. <laughs> <laughs> but I hope you will all join with me as I ask you to pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you from the depths of our heart for the gift of your Son. But our hearts are too weak. And so we turn now to the Immaculate Heart of the Blessed Virgin and ask for her intercession to gain the grace for us to pray in a way that you deserve as Abba Father for the gift of Jesus, your Son, and hers, that the power of the Holy Spirit might come over us and overshadow us to enlighten our minds with the light of divine truth and to enkindle our hearts with the fire of divine love that we might grow in our understanding, but that with your help we might live out faithfully all that we learn of these supernatural mysteries, these beautiful truths and realities that make up our faith, that make us your family. So help us and hear us as we pray the family prayer that Jesus taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, Pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady of the Holy Rosary, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, I've got the sense this past hour that the majority of you seem to be cradle Catholics. And so I suspect that for most of you, you can hardly remember a time where you are not already familiar with Fatima and Our Lady of Fatima. Well, that is not the case for me. I can remember vividly exactly where I was and what I was doing when I heard for the very first time about those three kids and that wonderful apparition from May until October 1917. For us to be able to join together to celebrate the 90th anniversary of that one occasion when six months after the first appearance, you have the miracle of the sun and so many more graces too. It's just a great and indescribable privilege for me, but I'll tell you, it was almost exactly 23 years ago that I first heard about it, because I was there at a hospital bed where my wife was laying there in labor. 
and I had been taking this husband coach childbirth. I was supposed to help her with her breathing, but the television was on, and I was distracted by the voice of Ricardo Montalban. And as a Protestant pastor, I should have turned the channel, but I didn't. I looked up and I listened and I watched as Ricardo Montalban described Our Lady of Fatima and the miracle that had happened back in 1917. And she kept looking at me and she said, "Would you help?" You know? <laughs> she said, "Turn that off." I said, "I'll turn the volume down." You know? <laughs> I was mesmerized. I I was stunned. After almost an hour, I was trying to figure out how to help her breathe through labor, while I was also trying to figure out how in the world did I miss out on this? I never heard of the miracle of sun. I never heard of Lucia, Jacinta, and Francesco. And here I was, sitting there in a chair next to my wife, who ended up getting a cesarean section that night. And I don't <laughs> accept the blame. <laughs> It wasn't her breathing, <laughs> but I remember because at that time in my own study, so many things kept coming up Catholic that I had basically prayed and studied myself into a crisis of faith. I'd already resigned my pastorate as a Presbyterian minister, and so I was taking a job in a college administration that would leave me evenings free to study. But I didn't think that this evening was going to be such an instructional, uh, instructional time, but it was. And I'd like to tell you that when the show was over, all I did was to focus upon my bride and her agony. But my mind was just split. I had to go and find more. And so, about three days later, I went out and found some materials about Fatima, and I fed my mind and my heart. And ever since, I have become more and more convinced. That this is one of the greatest gifts that God has given, not only to the Catholic Church in the modern era, but to the whole human family. And I want to echo so much of what you've already heard from uh, Dr. Miravalli because he expressed the concerns that many non-Catholics have when it comes to Marian doctrine and devotion, as the Catholic Church teaches and practices it. Because for many years, I was not only not a Catholic, not only was I a Protestant and a Presbyterian minister, but I was also a staunch anti-Catholic. And the one thing that probably upset me more than all of the other things—I mean, the Pope, the Eucharist, Purgatory—those were all problematic. But Mary, Mary seemed quite contrary to <laughs> the Bible that I read. And at root. It was more than just the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. It was more than just the doctrine or the dogma of her bodily assumption. It was also more than this sense that she is still functioning in terms of heavenly queenship. Those three doctrines just expressed to me a fundamental dread that I had that all of this detracts from Jesus. All of this robs Christ of glory, and so, as you explained, I opposed that teaching. Because I wanted to protect the glory of my Savior and Lord, and I wanted to bring honor to His name, and do whatever I could to take away from those who detracted from it. Now, of course, that I am a Catholic, there is one fundamental reason: because I don't see Mary detracting from the perfect work of Christ, our Redeemer. I see her refracting the light of His redemptive work. She no more detracts from Jesus than a prism detracts from light. When a light strikes a prism, the refraction of that pure light into the various colors across the spectrum display what was in that pure light when it hit the prism. Not only does the moon not detract from the sun, but the prism doesn't detract from the light. It reveals the perfect beauty of the redemptive work that Christ accomplished, because Christ didn't come and he didn't come to earth and become a man in order to redeem himself. He didn't come and die and rise again in order to get something that he lacked. It began to occur to me over the course of years, as a Protestant struggling with the Church's teaching, that I really had a fundamental misunderstanding of how we glorify God, because it seemed to me a kind of tug of war. That the more glory you give to Mary or the saints or the Pope or the priests, the less Christ gets. But in fact. 
Jesus didn't become a man, suffer, die, and rise again in order to get more glory than he had in the first place. He can't get any more. He's God. His glory is infinite, and his infinite glory is eternal. So if he didn't become a man, suffer, die, and rise in order to get more glory for himself, then why did he go to the trouble and go through all of that agony? Well, the scriptures are clear. At least they became increasingly clear to me. He did it to give us his glory. The glory as of the only Son of the Father. He came to share with us his own divine sonship. And so now, the one overarching reason why I embrace the Catholic Church's doctrinal teaching and devotional practices concerning the, the Blessed Virgin Mary, and the one overarching reason why I fully affirm the timeliness and the profound rightness of defining the fifth dogma is because I think this will show the world the revelation of Christ's glory and the perfection of his redemptive work where it is found in its most resplendent form, his mother, our mother. Jesus proclaimed the gospel, and then he proceeded to fulfill it. But as I said, the gospel didn't change the second person of the Trinity. The eternal son did not gain a single drop of glory for himself after living, dying, and rising as a human, which he lacked beforehand. God didn't create and redeem the world in order to get more glory, but rather to give it. We need to get over this notion that the God-creature relationship is a kind of master-slave relationship. That's the way I think a lot of people think. But no, what we have to grasp is the beautiful truth of the mystery of Abba Father. And we wouldn't know that truth until he sent his only son. And he taught us to pray in a way that they had never prayed before in ancient Israel. To pray our father, to call God Abba, to come to know him as Papa, Daddy, in the most intimate terms. Do we thus detract from Christ's finished work by affirming its perfect realization in the Blessed Virgin Mary? On the contrary, we celebrate the work of God the Father through his Son in this creature who is destined to be not only his daughter but the mother of his Son. Here we find the perfection of Christ's saving work which he accomplished not for himself but for us as humans. I am convinced that nothing brings a family together so much as when they celebrate a mother. We have done that for years with my bride for birthdays and anniversaries. We just did it recently for my mother-in-law and my father-in-law with their 50th anniversary. Nearly 500 people gathered together to celebrate their lives, their marriage, their family, their love. And it's really a, a wonderful thing to be married into a family with such a godly prince of a man as my father-in-law. He is clearly the head of a wonderful home, but she is the heart. And this is a natural human family, and she makes it warm with love. Think of how God would create a supernatural family, a divine family that reaches around the world and stretches from earth to heaven. How could we be a family if we have a father and his firstborn son as our oldest brother, but without a mother? But we are not without a mother. As we know from John 19, Verse 26, what does Jesus say to the beloved disciple? Behold your mother. And he's not talking to John alone. He's talking to all of those disciples whom he would call beloved. And so if he gives us his own mother to be ours, what would he withhold from us? I like the way that Mark drew in John 3.16, 3, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. But we hear in John 19, verse 26, that we could almost paraphrase, for Christ so loved the world that he gave us his only beloved mother to be our own. As exhibit A, proof positive that we're not just ransomed captives. We are adopted brothers and sisters. We are divine sons and daughters. And this is something that does not rob God of the glory. It reveals the glory of the Father that he accomplishes through the work of his Son by the power of the Holy Spirit, making us one with a oneness that originates inside of the blessed Trinity. Mary is not God. We're very clear on that. 
We do not give her the adoration of worship. But she is the mother of God. She is only a creature, but she is God's greatest creation. St. Thomas Aquinas was very emphatic about this. In the Summa Theologica, he says that there are three things that God has accomplished that cannot be improved upon. One is the hypostatic union. When you look at Jesus, the union of humanity and divinity is perfect. It could not possibly be improved upon. Number two, the beatific vision. Our life in God for all eternity will lack nothing. It cannot be improved upon. After billions and billions and trillions of years, it will pass by as one intense, intensely pleasurable second. You know, they say time flies when you're having fun. Trillions of years will seem like a moment with the joy of life inside the Holy Trinity. The beatific vision cannot be improved upon. So what's the third? The third thing that God has accomplished that cannot be improved upon is the Blessed Virgin. God could not fashion a creature greater than her. And this, again, gives all the glory to God because she is his handiwork. She is Christ's masterpiece. You see, the perfection of Christ's redemptive work manifested in her, not in Jesus, but in Mary, far better than you see it in Scott or Mark or any of us. God is accomplishing a father work in all of our lives, but his fatherly work is a work in process. It's a work in progress. It's a work that has to accommodate our weaknesses and our failures. And so when you see the Blessed Virgin Mary, someone who was conceived immaculately by the power of the Spirit of the Son who comes from the Father, when you see the Blessed Virgin giving her fiat and the power of the Most High overshadowing her, not only does the Spirit of God enable her to be conceived immaculately, but the Holy Spirit of God enables Jesus to be conceived virginally. And that virginity is perpetual. It is everlasting. She is the resplendent work of Christ, her Son and Savior, her Creator and her Redeemer. And so Jesus, like any true artist, has done many great works. But an artist often has to, you know, fulfill deadlines and, you know, fulfill contractual demands and produce many works. But every artist wants to save his very best to create the masterpiece. Well, here we have a divine artist with unlimited genius and love. And in the Blessed Virgin Mary, we behold the masterpiece of Christ. If you went to an art gallery to look at an exhibit and the artist himself showed up, do you think he would be threatened if instead of staring at him, you began staring at his greatest masterpiece? Of course not. He would take pride in the fact that you recognize the genius and the greatness of his work. When we behold our mother, we behold Christ's redemptive work. We behold the mother of God. To affirm the truth about Mary does not detract from Jesus, though not to affirm it does. Of all creatures that God has fashioned, the Blessed Virgin is the only person directly related to God by a natural bond of covenant kinship. She not only receives the gift of her humanity by her son through the Spirit, she turns around and gives to her son the flesh and blood. They share a bond of covenant kinship as mother to son. And so this bond is what enables us to share the new covenant grace of Jesus Christ through adoption. She has this covenant bond of divine kinship as the mother of God through the work of the Spirit in a way that is direct and unique. But it is something that is not so much exceptional as it is the plenitude. She has it not just to hoard it for herself, she has it to lavish it upon those who are her children. She gave consent not only to bearing Jesus, but to bearing the Redeemer of the world as co-redemptrix, as our mediatrix, as our advocate. She gave consent not only to bearing Jesus from the cradle to the grave and then beyond. She also gave consent to his suffering for us. 
She gave consent to becoming the mother of her son's torturers, of her son's executioners. We all know how much it hurts to be misunderstood. It hurts even more to have loved ones, our own children, misunderstood, mistreated, and abused. But you know, I have six kids, and they're all better than I deserve. But none of them are perfect, though at times they thought they were. (laughs) There's only one mother who ever had a child who was perfect and divine, the Blessed Virgin. And what does she give consent to? Slander, misrepresentation, torture, and then the most ignominious and shameful execution. I mean, I don't know about you, but I've sometimes put myself in her sandals and wondered why she didn't cry out. Do something. Show them who you are. You and I both know what you could do. Or she could turn around and just say, you have no idea what's coming. You have no idea who you're messing with. You think you've got the power to take his life? I'll tell you who has the power to take yours. You just you wait. But she didn't just bite, you know, she didn't bite her tongue. She didn't just kind of keep a stiff upper lip like a kind of maternal stoic. She gave consent not only to his suffering, but to his suffering for all of us who maligned him and misrepresented him and tortured and executed him to become her children. That is a heart that is deeper than any ocean. That is a heart that is greater and more inexhaustible than the universe itself. Her immaculate heart is the new creation, and it's immeasurably vaster than the old one. If only we could see what God sees, but we can't. That's part of the beauty of holiness. I'm reminded of St. Therese, who in one of her last entries in her journal described herself as a tiny seed. A tiny seed that nobody noticed. Even people in her own convent, even her own sisters, didn't notice what a heroic saint was in their midst until the story of the soul, until her diary was published. And then, of course, Pope Pius XI referred to this tiny little seed that up in heaven became what he called a hurricane of glory. What an image. Well, if Therese is a hurricane of glory, I think she would want us to know that the Blessed Virgin Mary is immeasurably more glorious. She is the one who leads us to Christ. Christ is the one who leads us to her. Jesus, as you know, subjected himself to his father's will. He subjected himself to the old covenant, to the Ten Commandments. He fulfilled the first three to God, his father, more perfectly than any creature ever did. He also fulfilled the last seven, which deal with our duties to our fellow humans. The first of which is what? Honor your father and mother. Indeed, he fulfilled this commandment more perfectly than any son has ever done by bestowing his own honor upon his heavenly father, but also by bestowing his divine honor upon his earthly mother. And we are simply called to imitate him. We are not supposed to love Mary any more than Jesus did. But what we long to do is to love her as just as he did. And that's what I ask him constantly, to empower me to love her as she deserved to be loved, but as he alone has loved her. And then I ask her, Give to me the grace to love Jesus as much as he deserves because nobody has done it like you. He gave her the power to love her son more than any mother ever did. And then the power to enable us to do the same. And that's why her privilege is not exceptional in the sense of excluding us. It is a plenitude that is given for precisely the purpose of including us. When you give something to a mother, you can be sure everybody in the family will get it, especially if they need it. And so, this is the heart and soul of what it means to be Catholic Christians, to live our lives as sons and daughters of God, in the Catholic Church as the family of God, and to behold the eternal Son of the Father and to hear Him 
and to thank him for the gift of his own mother to be ours. This is the love affair we call salvation. Now, there's a lot more to it than what I can say in one hour, but I want to identify something that I consider to be of greatest importance. And you can already get a sense of it because of what I've said thus far, and that is we have got to, we've got to transpose the gospel key out of the key of individualism into the key of the family. In Western civilization, we tend to think of individuals and their rights, and then the family and the state and all the other as institutions. But the family is different than all the other institutions. The family is not only something that God has designed beginning with the marital covenant. The family is what reflects who God is in his perfection. Pope John Paul II once stated, and I quote, God in his deepest mystery is not a solitude, but a family. Because God has in himself fatherhood, sonship, and the essence of the family, which is love. Notice he didn't say that God is like a family. He said that God is a family because God alone possesses fatherhood in its perfection from all eternity. He isn't like a father. I am like a father because my fatherhood is flawed. God's is not. He also possesses not only eternal fatherhood, but also eternal sonship. You see, father is not just a noun, it's a verb. He's eternally fathering. And that's why the son isn't younger than the father, or smaller, or weaker. He's co-eternal with the father. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, because he is begotten, not made. We're made, not begotten. We're creatures who have human nature. He is begotten from all eternity. He has divine nature. To father doesn't mean to lord it over a subject. It means to take your life and lavish it upon another as a gift of love. And to be a son means to image the father. If fathering is the dynamism of love, then for the son to image the father, he must take that life as a gift of love and give it back as lavishly as he got it. And what do you call the life, the gift, and the love from the father to the son and from the son back to the father? It's not a what. It's a who. It's the Holy Spirit. This constitutes the highest and the holiest mystery, but far from being a mathematical abstraction, this is an intensely interpersonal reality. Eventually, we will all call home if we get to heaven. Because the Holy Trinity is a divine family. And this recasts our understanding of everything that God the Father accomplishes through his Son, who is described by Paul as the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. He is the one who gives us the spirit of sonship in Romans 8.15. The Father sends the Son to give us the spirit so that our hearts will be stirred up to cry out what? Abba, Father. To come to know that God is more truly and perfectly our Father than our natural dads could ever be. This is what the new covenant accomplishes. This is what is so unique and definitive about the Christian religion. God sharing his own family life and love with all of humanity. And it began with the gift of Mary. In her immaculate conception, in her virginal conception of Jesus, in her co-redemptive work at the foot of the cross as well, she obeyed the Father by bearing his Son through the power of the Holy Spirit for us. The Apostle Paul speaks of this family mystery. Mark already quoted him in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 9. We read that we are God's co-workers. In the Greek, it's sunergoi. It's a strange term because you don't typically think of God as having assistance. Co-workers. Can't God get the job done himself? Why does God need co-workers? Because God is a father, and what is he doing? He's not spoiling his kids. He's raising them. Is a father threatened when his sons grow up and begin cutting the grass and raking the leaves and cleaning the garage? This father, I'll tell you, is not. (laughs) I am very pleased and fulfilled and slightly overweight from lack of exercise. (laughs) The work that God is doing is a fatherly work, raising sons and daughters to share in his work, which is redemptive. The work of redemption is more than getting people out of hell. 
It's bringing them home to heaven, but it's empowering them to reach out and to bring others, as many as possible, home with them. This is what Jesus has shared in an unparalleled way with the Blessed Virgin Mary, to whom God entrusted such co-working tasks as feeding his son, nursing him, singing him to sleep, teaching him to speak, accompanying him all the way to the cross, and then waiting for the gift of his spirit and teaching the apostles to pray like nobody had ever prayed before. This yes was not just given to Gabriel. This fiat mihi secundum verbum tuum, this yes from the heart of the Immaculata, is a yes that continues for all eternity. It is the yes of God's greatest creation. Could there be a more intimate co-worker with God than the only creature fashioned to be the mother of God. This is something that we could spend much more time on, but we're limited this afternoon. So I want to just kind of focus on a formula that Pope John Paul II seemed to have introduced. It's already been referred to, but I want to underscore it just briefly. And that is maternal mediation. Maternal mediation. And the reason I want to emphasize this is because Mark put his finger right on the pulse of this former Protestant when he cited that passage in 1 Timothy 2.5 where we read, what? That there is one mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ. I can't tell you how many hundreds of times I, th- I threw that in the face of my Catholic friends to show them how absurd and how unthinkable Marian doctrine and devotion were from a biblical standpoint. How dare we refer to Mary's maternal role as mediatrix? And yet that is precisely what motherhood means, most especially in the family of God. Mediatrix is just a theological term that captures the concrete truth, beauty, and reality of what it means to have a divine mother. She is not the mother of God in the sense of the originator of God, obviously. She's a creature, not the creator. But she's a mother in the truest sense of one who bears God. The bishops who defined the dogma of Theotokos, the mother of God, way back in 431 at the Council of Ephesus, thousands of faithful came down to Ephesus They waited all evening into the early morning hours until the bishops came out. Hundreds, 200 bishops came out and declared the definition of the dogma of Theotokos, the mother of God. The people responded with an exclamation, with shouts, with songs. They suddenly rushed the bishops, they hoisted them to their shoulders, and they carried them for blocks as a family celebrating the gift of a mother that came from the heart of God. This is who we are as the family of God. This is what Christ has accomplished as the one true mediator. This is what we need to understand much better. Because Christ has mediated the the covenant love of God the Father for us so perfectly that he has merited everything we need. Everything we need. But I used to assume that if Christ merited everything we need for salvation then there's no room left for Mary. Until I discovered the Catholic Church teaches that Christ merited everything for our salvation, including Mary's capacity to merit. Christ's intercession at the right hand of the Father is perfect. But far from excluding my own feeble prayers and intercession for others, Christ's intercession doesn't exclude mine, it empowers mine and enables me to pray with greater fervor and fruitfulness than I ever could on my own without the one and only mediator between God and man. The one mediator is the Son of the Father, the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Jesus is the one mediator because he is the firstborn Son, the eternal Son of the Father. Mary is the mediatrix because she is the mother, empowered by God's Spirit. And so everything she is, Christ made her. Everything she has, Christ gave her. And she didn't just get it in a passive way. She got it in a dynamic and active way or else she wouldn't be a mother. And so what we see is Christ 
has merited Mary's capacity to merit. He's merited our capacities to merit, as small as those capacities might be. But what do we mean by merit? If we're thinking of merit in strictly economic terms, then it's quite absurd to apply it to Mary or anybody else. But that is not what merit means. Merit comes from the the Bible. And the Bible is covenantal, not contractual. It is familistic. It is not economic. We're not looking at the U.S. Open where one man is the winner and everybody else is the loser. We're not looking at a bowling match where only one person wins and all the others congratulate him. We're looking at a family where everything the father has, he gives the son, and he returns the father in the power of the spirit, and they lavish it upon all of us, beginning with Mary, the exemplar of our salvation. So as St. Augustine writes, when God rewards us for our labors, he's only crowning his work in us. He has successfully fathered us through the Son by the Holy Spirit. We merit grace like a child earns dessert by eating everything else the Father put on his plate. We merit grace the same way children end up gaining an inheritance by staying in the family, by loving your brothers and sisters and doing your best to honor your parents. An inheritance is not something you strictly merit by some principle of abstract justice. By the grace of birth, you enter a family. You don't buy your way into my family. You you can't work your way into my family. How much more can we not buy or work our way into God's? But Mary didn't. She was fashioned as the mother of God through the power of Christ's spirit, as the daughter of the Father. And as the mother of the son and the spouse of the Holy Spirit, she is the greatest handy work of God, but she is proof positive, she is exhibit A, that God's redemptive work is a family affair. That we do not understand it properly unless we look at it in the light of God's fatherly action that raises us up as children. And her, not only as a daughter, but as a mother and a spouse as well. So let's remember That it's true that Christ has merited all graces for us, including Mary's capacity to merit. Christ's role as mediator secures all graces, including her role as mediatrix. Christ's intercession is all sufficient, but far from meaning that we don't need to pray, we can now pray in a more powerful way than we ever could apart from Christ, the one true mediator. Just as Christ is not a substitute but a representative, so Christ's suffering doesn't exempt us from suffering, does it? Rather, it endows our suffering with a redemptive value it would never have on its own. Christ's obedience doesn't get us off the hook so we don't have to obey. Christ's obedience is what secures the power of the Holy Spirit to enable us to obey in a way we never could on our own. And if that's true for us, How much more true is it for the only creature that he created to be his own mother? The one whom he has divinized more gloriously than any other. So we see, not only in the Blessed Virgin Mary, the resplendent beauty of God's redemptive work. And I want to say something here, just as a footnote. You know, we as Catholics are... Faithful. We are traditional. We are orthodox. We are conservative. We get a lot of labels. I want to do away with them and just say we are simply and uncomplicatedly Catholic. And as such, our faith doesn't rest or terminate in doctrinal propositions. The Catechism quotes St. Thomas by reminding us that our faith doesn't terminate in doctrinal propositions, but in the realities those doctrines convey. We need doctrinal formulations. We need the magisterium to define dogma because God made us with minds and the minds that he's given us feed on truth. Chesterton was right. We're not created just to have forever an open mind. The mind is like a mouth. It's not meant to remain open just as the mouth closes on meat so the mind closes on the mysteries of faith that are defined as doctrine, as dogmas, by the apostles and their successors, just as Jesus empowered them to do, just as he promised to safeguard and maintain them. So it's not only something that is a beautiful mystery and a reality. It is something that leads us back to the mystery of the magisterium. 
The Pope and all the bishops in union with the Pope are successors of the apostles. But too often we treat them, or we hear the media treating them, you know, sort of like the ref on the field, the overweight umpire behind second base. You know, it's a dirty job, but somebody's got to do it. You know, you're out. And if you argue, you're out of the game. You know, strike three, foul ball. But the magisterium, that is the Pope and all the bishops who are successors of the apostles, are united in a supernatural organism as the teaching arm of the church, the magisterium. They're not the umpires on the field. They're the players. They're the ones who are proclaiming the gospel, administering the sacraments. They're the ones who are the successors to the apostles. And we are in union with them by the power of the Holy Spirit who safeguards them. So what is a dogma? Well, on the one hand, before he was Pope Benedict, Cardinal Ratzinger stated, and I quote, dogma is, by definition, nothing other than the church's authoritative interpretation of Scripture. It's how we read the Bible according to tradition. Dogma is, by definition, nothing other than the church's authoritative interpretation of Scripture. So as Mark went down the list of the Marian dogmas, beginning in 431 with the Council of Ephesus, Theotokos, the mother of God, and then in 647 with Pope Martin I and the perpetual virginity of Mary, and then likewise in 1854 with Pope Pius IX and the Immaculate Conception, and then, of course, in 1950 with the, the definition of the dogma of Mary's Assumption by Pope Pius XII, working with all of the bishops in the church around the world. There are four dogmas. She's the mother of God. She's perpetually virgin. She is, in fact, the Immaculate Conception, but now she's been assumed into heaven, body and soul. For what purpose? Just to kind of wait for the rest of us? No, to pray and to gain the grace for the rest of us. That is what we celebrate in her heavenly queenship. She is the Queen Mother, and as such, she is co-redemptrix, mediatrix, and advocate. All those three terms do is to unpack the meaning of what she is now that she's glorified in heaven as the mother of God and the mother of God's children. And this is why the first four definitions of Marian dogma all basically help us plot a trajectory that leads straight to the fifth and final dogma. Because the fifth dogma explains who she is now and what she's doing until we all get home to share in this heavenly reunion. She is co-redemptrix. Not an alternative, not an equal, but as mother, she gave us our redeemer. As mother, she gave us our mediator. As mother, she is our advocate. I wish I had time, but I know that I don't, to go into how it was that I came ever so slowly and with great resistance but also with considerable excitement to discover that the Catholic Church is not just teaching truth authoritatively, but interpreting Scripture compellingly. Way back in high school and college, I used to challenge my Catholic friends, show me a text, the Immaculate Conception, the bodily assumption, or heavenly queenship. You know, and they'd run and hide when I came into the cafeteria. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't aware of the fact until I, I just met a few months ago with an old college friend of mine who we, we shared a fraternity, and he came up and he told me, he said, you know, I'm so glad you're Catholic. I'm like, why is that? He said, because when we were students and you walked into the cafeteria, I literally, I, I would get up and leave. I was afraid of you. <laughs> and I'm like, I, I didn't remember how I would just gently and lovingly harass <laughs> you papists, you know. But I remember a turning point in my life, sitting in class as a graduate student in seminary, when a professor just gave us a throwaway line. I don't think he remembers saying it, but he just happened to mention, oh, and he said, you know, to use a text as a proof text, to take a text out of context in order to use it as a proof text, he said, that's a pretext. <laughs> and I sat there squirming because I thought, well, that's what we do. We look for proof text to back up our beliefs. And so often it meant memorizing 20 or 30, or in my case, 50 or 60 New Testament verses, typically out of context, to kind of set you straight and get you out. 
I'm really sorry about all that. <laughs> it's a lifetime of joyful restitution that I'm doing here. But that teacher was right. But I had no idea how right he was. I'm not even sure he did. Because what I discovered is when you, when you read the Bible contextually, that means not just looking for a text in the New Testament. It means reading the new in light of the old and the old in light of the new. It took me almost two and a half, close to three years of studying scripture, reading the fathers and discovering the church's living tradition because they were never settling for proof texts. They would always read the New Testament text in light of the Old Testament context and there were three sources that I found especially helpful. They looked at Adam and Eve and saw Jesus as the new Adam, as St. Paul describes him in Romans 5 and 1 Corinthians 15. The first Adam was a type that prefigured the new, the last Adam. And the last Adam surpassed the first. But they also pointed out there was an Eve and then there was a new Eve. And the new one surpassed the first by untying the knot, by giving the new Adam a body, just as the old Eve gave the old Adam the forbidden fruit. To reverse the effects of disobedience. The new covenant was brought about by a new Adam, but not a new Adam alone, but a new Eve. I remember looking at John, the Gospel of John chapters 1 and 2, and seeing the parallels with Genesis 1 and 2. How does Genesis 1 begin? In the beginning. How does John 1 begin? In the beginning. How does God create in Genesis? He speaks the word, let there be light. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And all things came into being through that word, and that word became flesh and dwelt among us. But in John 1, verses 29, 35, and 43, you find what you find in Genesis 1. The next day, the next day, the next day. And then eventually you get to the seventh day in Genesis 1 and 2, and you have Adam and Eve. In John 1 and 2, you come to the seventh day, and there's a marriage. There's a wedding feast at Cana. But the bride and the groom are not named. In fact, none of the characters are identified. Only two. And who are they? Jesus and Mary. But he doesn't call her Mary. He doesn't call her mom. He uses the same term Adam used when he first beheld Eve. And what is that? Woman. Woman. Because this is a new covenant. It's a mystical marriage with a new Adam and a new Eve. And he uses that term once more in chapter 19. When she's at the foot of the cross, not only is she bride, but she's now mother. Behold your mother. So I saw the new Adam, and I saw the new Eve, and I discovered the sources of the church's teaching about the Immaculate Conception. Because Protestants agree with Catholics on three-fourths of this proposition. Protestants and Catholics agree that Adam and Eve and Jesus were all created with original sin. We're just squabbling about the new Eve. But if the new covenant surpasses the old, and the new Adam is created with original sin, how fitting it would be for the new Eve to be also. And so it's an argument from fittingness. It's the logic of God's fatherly love. And I found the same kind of tradition in the scripture when you read the new in light of the old with respect to Mary as the Ark of the New Covenant. You go back to Exodus and you see how God uses Moses to bring his people out of bondage. But it wasn't Moses alone. By the time they got free and they met God at Sinai, Moses gave way to the tabernacle, the sacred tent. And what made it so sacred was the Holy of Holies. And what made that so holy was the Ark of the Covenant, where God's Word was contained in that box. The covenant law of God, written with the finger of God, that box covered with gold contained the Word of God in stone. Well, Luke derives his own description of the Annunciation from the traditions of the Ark of the Covenant to show that Mary contains the Word of God not in stone but in flesh. And that the terms and the phrases and the events that describe the Ark of the Covenant and how God used it to lead Israel long after Moses died, to lead Israel even after Joshua died, to lead Israel even after David finished the conquest and Solomon built the temple, the Ark of the Covenant was the proof of God's abiding presence because it contained the very Word of God and the manna as well. Well, if that was the holiest piece of furniture on the planet Earth in the Old Covenant... What about the woman who contains the word of God in flesh? The true manna. And so in Luke 1 and 2, just like John 1 and 2, the Father showed me how Mary is the ark of the new covenant. The third and last tradition that I discovered, studying not proof texts, but New Testament texts read in the context of the Old Testament, 
was not only Mary as the new Eve and Mary as the Ark of the New Covenant, but also Mary as the Queen Mother of the Son of David. Because there are really three, if you study the Old Testament for as long as I have, you'll notice that there are many important events, but three mountain peaks that tower over all the others. Creation, when the world came to be. Exodus, when Israel came to be. And the kingdom of David, when Israel came to be the source of instruction and light for all the nations. So in creation, we have a new Adam and a new Eve. In the Exodus, we have Moses and the ark and a symbol of Jesus, the new Moses, and Mary, the new ark. But in the kingdom, you've got the son of David. And who is Jesus? The opening verse of the New Testament, the book of the genealogy of Jesus, the son of David. And then you've got the royal genealogy to back it up. But you also find that as long as the Davidic son reigned over the kingdom of God on earth, he never reigned alone. Beginning with Solomon and following every successor, you have at the right hand of the king, guess who? The queen mother. In Hebrew, the Gebi Ra. She was a permanent fixture in the kingdom of God established with the line of David. And I discover that in Matthew 1 and 2, just like in John 1 and 2 and Luke 1 and 2, you have the Old Testament illuminating this text where suddenly the Blessed Virgin is from the line of David and she is the virgin who shall conceive a son and she is identified in terms of the Queen Mother, the Queen Mother of the Son of David. All of this, of course, you can find kind of interwoven braided, as it were, in the book of Revelation, chapters 11 and 12, where John describes the Ark of the Covenant, but not on earth, but in heaven. Not a box, but a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and she's crowned with 12 stars, and what's that? The zodiac? No, the 12 tribes of Israel. She is crowned as the Queen Mother, she is the Ark of the New Covenant, and she is woman, and the ancient serpent knows it. She's the new Eve, and the serpent attacks, only this time he loses. These traditions, these texts, this context is how the church wants us to drink deeply from the wellspring of Scripture. And I did it with a little help from the fathers, but I did it over the course of almost three years of of scholarship, study, (laughs) personal ingenuity, intellectual cleverness, or so I thought. You know, I like to think that converts experience the graces of a kind of honeymoon because my first year as a Catholic was truly graced. In spite of me. (laughs) I will tell you a a story very briefly. It concerns a relative of mine who happens to be a minister. Since I have five relatives who are ministers, I'm going to keep them safe and anonymous. (laughs) But I'll tell you this much. This particular family member fought me extra hard when he heard that I had poked, as he put it. (laughs) Slammed the tiber. And so we were both looking forward to the first opportunity we could have to kind of, you know, do a little bit of biblical wrangling, if you will. (laughs) Studio wrestling. Well, our wives were determined to prevent that from happening, but after dinner one night, we both decided to help him out by taking out the garbage, and we snuck into the office in the basement where we just went at it, (laughs) tooth and nail, for almost four hours. And I mean, we, he wanted to talk about the Pope and the Eucharist and purgatory and the saints, but you could tell there was one thing stuck in his craw, and it was the same thing that was stuck in mine for years, and that was Mary, Mary, quite contrary to the Bible. <laughs> and so he challenged me. And so I reminded him of what he had heard from the same professor I had heard, that to take a text out of context and use it as a proof text is a, pre, is a, is a pretext, and so we've got to read it contextually. And then I basically unloaded two and a half years of research on him, all about Mary as the new Eve, Mary as the Ark of the New Covenant, Mary as the Queen Mother of the Son of David, Christ the King. And he was listening, and he was looking at me like, where'd you come up with this? You know, and he was like, this is ingenious, this is intriguing. It isn't altogether compelling, but, you know, I could tell he was fascinated, even if he wasn't converted into one night. Sometimes you mistake yourself for the Holy Spirit, as I did that evening. (laughs) But I mean, I was just deploying text after text after text in context, referring to the fathers, and basically summarizing two and a half years of brilliant personal innovation, (laughs) clever ingenuity, academic achievement at the highest level. And then our spouses found us. They came down and they outed us out of his office. They said, stop this, you know, and, and we did, but it was nearly midnight by then. 
The next morning, I was halfway through breakfast when I looked up at the calendar and I noticed a particular date. It was August 15th. <laughs> you see, you can't memorize chapters and verses in the Bible, I see, but you can, <laughs> you got those holy days down. I was a newbie. <laughs> I didn't know all of these holy days, but I recognized this one, and I realized I'm going to have to get to church somehow. I had to go to Mass. So I, you know, I, I asked in the family, is there a Catholic church around? Well, there's only one. What is it? Our Lady of Victory. That sounded <laughs> sweet in my ears. You know? So I... So I, I, I asked for directions, and they were pretty complex, and that's when my relative spoke up and he said, I could drop you off. And I'm like, you know, no, you're going to end up having to wait out in the parking lot for an hour. And he said, I could do some shopping. And I'm like, that's fine. And he said, or I could come in. And I said, that's even more fine. You know? <laughs> and so he drove me there and he walked in. We didn't really speak because it was still kind of, you know, it was still echoing from the night before when I deployed all of those texts in context. We sat down. And we prepared ourselves through prayer. He's a very devout believer. And then when the priest came out, we all stood up except for him. He's Protestant, so he just wanted to sit there as an observer, just the same way I had done a year earlier. And as we sat back down and the lector got up and read, I couldn't help but notice him. That the lector was reading from 2 Samuel 6, which is where we'd ended our argument the night before. <laughs> Where David takes the Ark of the Old Covenant up to the earthly capital city of Jerusalem, the royal capital of the Davidic kingdom. And I use that as one of the texts to show how the New Testament reveals the fulfillment of Mary as the Ark of the New Covenant. And then the second passage at this particular holy day, the Feast of the Assumption, was Psalm 132. It's the only psalm out of 150 devoted to the Ark of the Covenant being carried up into the earthly capital of the city of Jerusalem. And then the next reading was taken from the book of Revelation, chapters 11 and 12, where John sees not the Ark of the Old Covenant on earth, you know, made of wood covered with gold, but the Ark of the Covenant in the divine temple in heaven. And the very next thing he describes is a woman clothed with the sun. This isn't a wooden box this is the woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, crowned with 12 stars. She's the queen mother, the ark of the new covenant. She's the new Eve. And this is the third reading. And then for the piece de resistance, it was Luke 1. It was the Annunciation where Luke describes Mary as the ark of the new covenant. And when I sat down, I felt like I just won the lectionary lottery. <laughs> My relative and dear friend leaned over and he said, did you have anything to do with the, the selection of these texts? <laughs> yeah, I said, you know, the, the Pope called me last week, you know. <laughs> and as I sat there listening to the homily, I felt set free. I felt liberated from all of my academic ingenuity, my intellectual prowess. I had spent two and a half, almost three years reinventing the wheel. I wasn't so clever after all. In fact, I discovered that day and every day since how much better it is to be highly unoriginal <laughs> and to recognize that this is the way that Scripture is read from the heart of the church and has been since the very beginning. As it was in the first century, it is now in the 21st century, we're always going to be hearing about Our Lady on her feast days, listening to how God prepared the human family to become His own by preparing the gift of the Mother of God, who is the new Eve, who is the Ark of the New Covenant, who is the Queen Mother. She's daughter Zion. She's so much more. She's Jacob's ladder. The Old Testament is filled with major and minor images, the burning bush that the fathers showed. These don't just point to Jesus. These also point to Our Lady. And this is what is served up in every main course we call the Bread of Life in the Liturgy of the Word, and the scriptures ought to be causing our hearts to be burning within us. Remember those two disciples on the road to Emmaus? What did they say? Our hearts were burning within us as he opened up the scriptures. But did they recognize Jesus? Not until what? The breaking of the bread. And what does that refer to? The Eucharist. So the scriptures prepare us 
to celebrate the mystery of Jesus Christ in the Holy Eucharist. The Holy Eucharist actualizes and fulfills the saving truth of Scripture. But none of this happens apart from the Blessed Virgin. She is there at every Mass. Just as she was at the foot of the cross, so she is present, just as John describes in the visions of the heavenly liturgy in Revelation 11 and 12. She is there alongside of her son. He is the king of kings. He is the high priest. She is the queen mother. She is the ark of the new covenant. She is the temple of God's spirit. And if we could just see 50% of her glory now, we'd be blinded. God mercifully spares us and accommodates our weaknesses so that we walk by faith and not by sight. But faith grasps not only the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, but the real presence of the Blessed Virgin Mary at the foot of the cross at his priestly sacrifice for us whenever that new covenant is renewed. Is this cool or what? (laughs) This is what it means to be Catholic. This is how we should be reading the scriptures because this is how the scriptures are read from the heart of the church way back in the first century and still now in the 21st century. And I also want to just say in closing that this is how I came to see the Immaculate Conception. She's the new Eve. The bodily assumption she's carried to the heavenly Jerusalem like the ark was carried to the earthly. She's the queen mother in the heavenly Jerusalem next to her divine son, the king of kings. But this is also how I discovered what else? She's the co-redemptrix as the new Eve. She is also the mediatrix. The ark was the ark of the covenant. Jesus is the mediator of the covenant. She is the one who bears the mediator. That's what mediatrix means. And she is the advocate because that's what the role of the queen mother is. She advocates the cause of the members of God's royal family. This isn't just true as dogma. It's dogma because it's real. And the reality is infinitely more beautiful and glorious than any words you will hear today. So let's close our eyes and lift up our hearts and ask for help. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, you are, you are our Creator, our Lord, our Lawgiver and Judge. But far more, you are Abba Father. And we know it. And we can live it because of the gift of your Son. And so in the name of Jesus, once more we pray for the gift of the Holy Spirit. To come down upon us that the power of God's Spirit, your Spirit, might overshadow us. To enable us to love Jesus as Mary did. And to love her as Jesus did. So help us and hear us as we pray the family prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou. And blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady of the Holy Rosary, pray for us. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Just briefly, I want to mention that all that I was sharing today is just an encapsulation of a, a book entitled, Hail Holy Queen, the Mother of God in the Word of God. And that's where I go through all of the Old Testament and New Testament traditions as I discover them. And I mention this because it's great to hear talks and to go home with memories and warm feelings, but those will dissipate. I want to encourage you to take advantage of the resources that are available downstairs at various tables. I want to especially encourage you to read the scripture, study the catechism, and discover St. Maximilian Kolbe. However you can. The resources down there, go online, ask your friends, ask your priests, find out more about the greatest Mariologist of all times, as I think he is. And as a a primer, I would recommend this little book, Hail Holy Queen. It answers all of the objections that uh, I used to raise, at least I do my best to. I also have another book that's out called Reasons to Believe, because we all know a lot of people who raise questions not only about Mary, but the Pope, 
purgatory, the saints, the sacraments, and all of the rest. So I wrote a book called Reasons to Believe, How to Understand, Explain, and Defend the Catholic Faith, mostly drawing from the scripture as it's read in the church's living tradition. I also wanted to mention the Lamb's Supper, a book where I deal with the, the, the book of Revelation and how it corresponds to the liturgy of the Eucharist, the Mass as we know it, and also how Mary is an important part of the visions of John in Revelation 11 and 12 and how she's an important part of the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And recently I came out with a sequel called Letter and Spirit. It's the sequel to the Lamb's Supper. It's basically how to read the Bible from the heart of the church in the liturgy. I kind of unpacked it a, a little bit more in a high school text. <laughs> My kids are teenagers. What else can I say? You know, I want them to get it up. So I, I want them to get up for the scriptures. And so I, I wrote a book called Understanding the Scriptures, a complete course on Bible study. I, I, uh, I'm, I'm using it now with my kids, but I was really taken aback just uh, a couple of weeks ago. A woman stopped me. She said that she had a 15-year-old daughter who was just kind of far from the faith. And she picked up this book around 9 p.m. And her mom didn't know it, but she was up till 4 a.m. reading. She came, she got up and she was following her mom around and she was telling me the next day, she's like, like, Mom, you never told me the Bible was so exciting, that the, the, the church's teachings are all rooted in Scripture, that the Mass takes us to heaven. And So this woman gave me a hug, and all I wanted to do was to say, thanks be to God, because this, this is the truth of our faith, and we really want to do our best to get it across to the next generation. So there are resources downstairs. I hope you really take advantage of those. Take them home for yourselves and for your loved ones. After all, I am a professor. And so I can't give you a test, but I can at least recommend that you study and read and discover the glory and the beauty of the truth of our faith. God bless you all. Well, we'll be asking questions after that one, I think. Very powerful talk. Thank you very much, Dr. Hahn.